Um, I was going to say, if, if I can be of help to you, even though we're not uh, together, uh, there's plenty of communication available, and uh, feel free to give me a call. I'd be, be glad to, to be of help. But most of all, I want to encourage you to stay faithful to the Lord. Uh, don't let this be a time of slacking off. Uh, let it be a time of, of growing in the Lord and uh, growing closer to Him. And uh, I've been encouraging folks to reach out to each other and uh, particularly during the week to, to pray together. And I hope that you'll do that. That will strengthen you. It'll strengthen our church. And if you have particular prayer requests, do email me and let me, let me know. I'll be happy to share those, those with people. We're continuing this morning in the book of First Thessalonians. Uh, I'm finding it a real blessing. Uh, he started in chapter 1 about uh, the church's testimony. Uh, this was a, a great church. Uh, God had, had blessed others through them. In uh, verse 7, it said, ye were in samples to all that believe. Uh, that, that's what we want to be as a church. We want to be a, a godly church, an example to others. In uh, chapter 2, he talked about his testimony. Uh, you know, every Christian has a testimony. Every Christian should have a ministry. Uh, the Bible says there in chapter 2, verse 4, uh, we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel. Uh, what a blessing that God has given us that, that ministry in general, and then specifically others. And he talked about our, our walk as Christians in chapter 2, verse 12, that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and his glory. Uh, today we're going to be looking in chapter 4, and, and he continues that thought uh, of our walk. But then in chapter 3, he talked about our help. He wasn't able to be with them, so he sent someone. And, you know, there's always people that God puts in our life to help us. And one of the main ones that should be in your life is your pastor. <laughs> you should be a part of a church. You should have a pastor. And uh, God blesses in that way. God used Timothy and Paul in those ways. But then he also wrote to them. God has given us his word. We, we hear directly from the Lord and can respond to that. And then he prayed for them. We have help. We're going to start in uh, chapter 3 and verse 11 and go down into chapter 4 this morning. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 11, he says, Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another, and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. Stop reading there. Uh, he's talking about the walk, uh, walking to please God. Uh, the, the title for my message this morning is How to Please Your Father. And that's what we want to do as Christians. We want to please our Heavenly Father. And that walk starts by a step of faith. We become Christians by putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. In John 1.12, he says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And that step of faith leads to a walk of faith. And that's what he's talking about here in 1 Thessalonians 2 and then in chapter 4. And he, he mentions there in verse 1, So ye would abound more and more. A walk means making progress. Uh, you're, you're going somewhere. You're moving along. He wants us to, to be growing in pleasing the Lord and abounding in, in pleasing the Lord. God expects us to be growing. He, he uses a very strong word there in verse 1. He says, we beseech you. Uh, that means uh, I'm begging you. Uh, this is something very important. And, and I think we forget sometimes how important it is for us to be right with God. Uh, it, it will help us, but it, it's, it's for the glory of God. Then he uses a very personal word. He says, and exhort you. Uh, exhort means to come alongside. And he's saying, I, I'm a fellow traveler. Uh, I'm, I'm walking this walk as well. And then in chapter 4, uh, he, he gives us some specifics about this walk. But he, he mentions there in verse 1, as ye have received of us, so abound. Now, how do, how do we receive uh, what, what God gives us? How, how, are they, how are they supposed to have received what God had said to them? By faith. And that's how we abound. We abound by faith. Let me read on in, uh, in verse 2. 
He says, For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified, for God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. So he gives us, he talks about some commandments here. And I think this harks back to uh, Acts chapter 15, when uh, in the early days, uh, Jews and Gentiles, this was a new thing, uh, the church, Christians being united in a, in, as a church, as churches. And uh, the Jews didn't know, are, are we supposed to give up everything Jewish? Uh, the, the Gentiles, you know, are we supposed to become Jews? And so they had a, a meeting, and the commandments they came up with, I think it was, it was James speaking, and he said that we write unto them that they abstain from pollution of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. So they narrowed it down just to those, uh, those four things that they, they needed to be careful of. And uh, the, uh, the church there at Thessalonica, they had, the Bible says, turned to God from idols, so that wasn't a, a problem. Uh, it didn't seem to be a problem with, with blood, but they lived in a very wicked city. And uh, fornication was, was a way of life. It, it, was, it was part of the main religion uh, there in, in Thessalonica. Uh, the word fornication is, in the Greek is pornea. You recognize that as uh, part of pornography. And uh, pornography is nothing new. Uh, they had it in, in their day. And it was very, very wicked. We live in a wicked society. Uh, pornography is a, is a scourge uh, to our country, but particularly to men. Uh, but uh, not, not only people are looking at it, but the people that are making it. You know, what uh, a terrible destruction is, is going on in the hearts and lives of people. And because of it, uh, there's great disease. Um, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, He that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Uh, we're seeing uh, terrible uh, physical uh, diseases that, that are happening. A and as well, we're seeing abortion. When people are not actually loving each other, but just uh, living in, in lust, uh, the result of sexual sin then is considered a nuisance. A and children are killed uh, in abundance. I, I looked at the statistics from 2018, I know that's two years ago, uh, but in 2018, eight million people died from cancer, five million died as a result, result of smoking, almost two million from AIDS, but it was 42 million babies that were killed in 2018. 42 million. Uh, the, the primary cause of death was children being killed by their parents. Um, what, a, what a terrible uh, statement about our, our way of life. I don't think um, we can just point our finger at those in Thessalonica. Uh, we live in a, in a wicked world today. And, and we see the, the destruction of marriage. Uh, people have taken love out of relationships and have just brought it down to, to lust. And God's commandment for us is, to abstain, abstain from fornication. And the reason is, his will is our sanctification. God wants us to be set apart uh, to him. Uh, like he'd said back there in 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 9, uh, how ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. See, being set apart is from something and to something. Uh, we are set apart from sin to God. And the, the reason is so that we can know the Lord. We can know God's purpose for our life. Uh, there was a well-known uh, person in uh, the media who said that she quit believing in God when she read that God is a jealous God. And she thought that meant that God is selfish. 
Well, in a way, God is selfish. He wants you to know real love. He wants you to love him. He doesn't want you to go to hell. He doesn't want you to, to uh, experience the destruction of sin. Uh, our God is a jealous God. Yes, the Bible says that over and over because he loves us and because he wants the, the very best for us. Sanctification is God's will. God wants you to separate yourself to him. He doesn't want you to be involved in the immorality and destruction of sin. Now, sanctification has three aspects. Uh, the first is at salvation. At salvation, uh, God separates you to himself. We call that positional. He changes who you are. He changes where you are. He takes you out of darkness, places you in the light. Takes you out of death, puts you into life. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6 says, uh, Such were some of you. He's talking about the sin of their, their world. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Changed, sanctified, uh, number one, at, at salvation. Secondly, when we get saved, we begin the walk of, uh, of the Christian life. And the, the second aspect of sanctification is growing in the Lord. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 12, he talked about um, how he wants us to abound, increase and abound in love. He wants us to be growing. Uh, at the end of verse 1 in chapter 4, so you would abound more and more. God wants us to be making progress uh, in our Christian life. In 2 Peter 3.18, he says, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, there's going to be a lot of things as, as you walk with Jesus that are going to be new to you, and, and you're going to learn them, and you're going to grow uh, in faith. So first, uh, we're changed who we are. Our position has changed, but then our walk continues to change all our life. But then thirdly, there's the final aspect of salvation. That's when we go to heaven, and, and we're not only with Jesus, we're like Jesus. Uh, 1 John 3, 2, when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Uh, you know, what a blessing. And the, the command here is abstain from fornication. And the reason is, his will is our sanctification. He wants us to walk in holiness. And the reason God wants that, one of the reasons, is he knows that's the very best thing for us. Uh, there's, there's some things he talks about here in this chapter that will help us to know what to do. Verse 4, he says that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Now, your vessel is your body. And what he's saying there is don't let your body control you. You control your body. And the reason you can do that is, number one, sanctification. You belong to God. You've been taken out of darkness into light. And secondly, because of honor. He says, in sanctification and honor. It's, it's your value. You know, people are always looking for value. Well, the main value you have is that you belong to God. If you're not a Christian, the value you have is that you're made in the image of God and you can know God. As a Christian, uh, you belong to God, and that changes everything. Uh, Romans chapter 6, I've found a real help and, and blessing in this area. Romans chapter 6 makes this statement. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. God has given us newness of life. That baptism he's talking about there is not, there's no water involved there. He's talking about being placed in Christ, spiritually. Uh, you're made new. And down in, in verse uh, 11, he says, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Uh, don't let your body control you, and you don't have to because you've been set apart, uh, because you have value uh, in the Lord. You belong to the Lord. If you, if you look at the owner's manual, uh, he tells us this, 
Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. That's 2 Timothy 2, verse 22. Uh, God says, uh, don't hang around with immorality. Uh, don't uh, contemplate it. Don't, uh, don't spend time with it. He says, run away from it. You control your body. Don't let your body control you. And one of the reasons we can do that, we belong to God, but as well because we have the Holy Spirit. At the end of verse 8 there, he says, God who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. Uh, in Galatians, he says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Uh, in Corinthians, he, he puts it as a question. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? which you have of God and you're not your own, for you're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. They belong to God. Uh, we need to be careful that we don't let our body control us. And God says we can do that uh, by his strength and, and his grace. He tells us in Ephesians 5.18, be filled with the spirit. The, uh, the parallel passage in Colossians calls it letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly. If you want to be filled with the Spirit, you need to be filled with God's Word. Let God and His Word control you, not your body. Secondly, in, uh, in verse 5, he says, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. He's saying there, don't live like the world. As Christians, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. And he says we're not to love the world. Uh, we're not to live like the pagans, like the heathen. We're we're to be saved out of our culture. We don't have to incorporate our culture into our religion. Uh, we need to, to be living for Christ. And that word concupiscence there, it's just talking about uh, very strong lust. And uh, as I thought about that this week, I thought, boy, that really describes our society today. People are very strong in their lust. And in fact, they encourage that. They say, you know, follow your heart. You know, live your passion. And... Uh, then they're surprised uh, when their, their world has, has problems. You know, as Bible believers, we're not surprised when the world operates selfishly and sinfully. We, we realize that's the way it is. But that's not normal for a Christian. As Christians, uh, we need to be careful that our eyes are not on the world, but that our eyes are on the Lord. Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. We don't want to live like the world. You know, both Christians and non-Christians will sin. But sin is worse for a Christian because we know better and we know the Lord and we have the Holy Spirit. Well, then the third thing he says there in uh, verse 6, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter. Don't take advantage of others. Uh, your life should be a blessing to others, not a problem. It should be an encouragement, not a temptation. And he's talking there particularly to us as, as Christians. Be a blessing in how you live. The word defraud there means to use your situation to wrong someone. Uh, we live in a world today where people have a, a, lot of, a, a lot of sex is going on, but there's no love. Uh, there's a lot of children being conceived, but many of them are being killed, and, and there's no love. Kids are being raised in homes uh, without love. And the problem is that people are saying, well, if you love me, you'll do this. Well, listen, if real love is involved, you'll do it right. You'll honor God's boundaries. Uh, you'll honor God's, God's word. Uh, what a blessing it is in our church uh, to have uh, modest, moral Christians. You know, when we come to church, we don't have to worry that it's going to be a temptation to our eyes and to our, our senses. And that's a blessing. You know, you go out into the community, and man, it's hard. Uh, as a man, it, it's hard sometimes uh, seeing people who are, who are dressed so immodestly and, and immorally. We, uh, we need to be people who are not defrauding others by how we live. In uh, 1 John chapter 5 and, and verse 2, God makes this statement. I've always found this, this interesting. He says, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. Most people put it the other way around. 
They say that the way you know you're loving God is by loving people. You know, God says the way to know how to love people is to honor God. God first. Put God first. And God will help us. Uh, as we love God, it will, it will help us to do the right thing by others. Uh, we can't live immoral lives and say we're, we're loving people. Uh, that's concupiscence, the lust of concupiscence. Uh, you know, God says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And God gives us the boundaries uh, for marriage. You know, people today are so afraid of physical illness. Uh, our room is empty today because we have to keep away from each other because of physical illness. Listen, the greater danger is spiritual illness. And people are, are dying uh, because people's hearts are so uh, separated from God and they're, they're killing their children, they're, they're uh, molesting each other and, and doing all kinds of, of terrible things to each other, sometimes in the name of love and yet without any, any standard. God says if, if we really want to love people, we need to keep God's commandments. We need to, to honor the Lord. Now, why should we do this? I've found, as I've gotten older, that my motivations have changed. Uh, when I was a little boy, uh, I was motivated by fear. Uh, my parents believed in spanking children, and uh, we found that, that it helped. <laughs> as, as a little boy, you know, I, I found that there was things I, I didn't do because, ooh, I'd be in trouble if I did that. But you know, as I grew older, left home, got married, and so on, I wasn't worried about my dad spanking me anymore. And I was motivated by love. And, and as, as time grew, went on, uh, you know, I was, I was motivated to love him. M much stronger motivation than, than fear was. In, uh, in Jude, he talks about, uh, of some have compassion, making a difference. Others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. There's different motivations for what we do, but we need to be motivated uh, by both God's judgment and God's love. There in um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and the end of verse 6, he says that no man, uh, read the whole verse, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we have forewarned you and testified. Uh, we do need to be motivated by God's judgment. We need to understand we're going to give an account. Uh, God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. In Galatians, he says, be not deceived. God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. But you know, we, we should also be motivated by, by God's love. In, in verse 7, you see, God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. God's call is to the best. God wants the best for us. God's favor. You know, he, he says in, in, in the Gospels, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God wants what's good for us, and his call uh, is a wonderful call. There's a couple of verses in, in 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 9. He says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and, and holy nation, a peculiar people. There's God's call. Uh, he wants us to be honored and blessed, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And he says in, in verse 11, Dearly beloved, there's God's love, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, that's strangers and pilgrims in the world, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. We need to understand, God knows that sin wars against our soul. It tears us up. It causes the problems that we experience. And God's call is, get away from that. Come to me. Uh, live a holy life. Trust me, he, God is saying. God wants the very best for us. You know, God has given, for instance, marriage. That comes from God. That's not a human uh, design. That's God's design. And God has boundaries for marriage. Now, that's not a prison. That's a beautiful private garden. Uh, those boundaries are there uh, for our protection and for our blessing. And yet many uh, try to go around God's boundaries and say, oh, no, we, we love each other too much. And uh, we, we don't have to wait for God's boundaries. Listen, uh, if you want God's blessing, you need to follow God's word. In uh, our, our text there, in the beginning of verse 8, it says, He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God. 
Listen, our country can make all the rules they want to about marriage. But if you despise marriage, you're not despising your country. You're despising God. Uh, I've been a licensed uh, marriage celebrant. Uh, when they changed uh, to homosexual marriage, I, I sent it in. I said, I I'm not having any part of that. I can still marry people before God, but I'm not going to do it before a state uh, that makes it a, a mockery. Uh, God's call is to holiness. Don't despise God. Don't despise God's word. And God will help us uh, by showing us uh, there is a, a, a standard. There is judgment, but there's also God's, God's call to holiness and to love. And he helps us with his Holy Spirit. God, who, verse 8, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. You know, when, when we sin, it offends the Holy Spirit. Uh, in, in 1 Corinthians, he says, Know ye not uh, that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. And then he says, He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. When you know the Lord, uh, your body, your soul, everything about you belongs to him and needs to be used uh, to honor him. God's Holy Spirit helps us in that. And when we give ourselves to sin, it ignores the Holy Spirit's leading. He talks in verse 8 about he that despiseth. Uh, we're despising the Holy Spirit's leading. We're looking this morning at how to please your Heavenly Father. And he says, this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Man, that's very specific, isn't it? The thing I would ask you this morning is, are you in God's will? Or are you despising it? Are you living for the flesh? Or are you living for the Spirit? God has His will for your life. And number one, God says it's not His will that any should perish. It's God's will for you to be saved. He says that in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. God doesn't want you to go to hell. God wants you to be saved. Secondly, if you're saved... He tells us here, God's will is your sanctification, to be set apart to Him. Not living like the world, not living for the world, but living for God. Uh, we read in verse 3, this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. In verse 7 he said, for God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Sanctification. Uh, God uh, setting us apart uh, for himself. And folks, the, the power of salvation is not in us. The power of salvation is, is not in you. It's in Jesus. Acts 4.12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Uh, what a blessing. Uh, the power of salvation comes from God himself. And the power to live the Christian life is not in you either. It's not in me. It's in Christ and in His Holy Spirit. Uh, I would encourage you this morning, uh, won't you trust Him? Won't you trust the Lord Jesus, uh, who, who alone can save? In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23, he's bringing the, book, uh, the letter to a conclusion, and he says, The very God of peace sanctify you wholly, completely. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is He that calleth you, who also will do it. Uh, what a blessing. I, I wanted to uh, conclude with uh, some words from uh, one of our hymns. Come every soul by sin oppressed, there's mercy with the Lord. And he will surely give you rest by trusting in his word. For Jesus shed his precious blood, rich blessings to bestow. Plunge now into the crimson flood that washes white as snow. For Jesus is the truth, the way, that leads you into rest. Believe in him without delay, and you are fully blessed. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for the way of salvation, that you are the way. Lord, I pray if there are those listening today that are not saved, that they would come to you. Uh, Father, I pray that you'd help us as Christians to live for you, or to set aside the sin that so easily besets us. Uh, thank you for this time together today, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Mm -hmm.